Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. This is Zenith, that podcast where we lost the game, because this week we watched Countdown. Written by Terry Nation. Directed by Via Lorimer. Back again. And aired on March 6th, 1979. It's my home dog, Via Lorimer, back again to direct another episode. And it's my homeboy, Terry Nation, Nation. back again to write. Great, Terry Nation, back in the writer's chair. It doesn't inspire as much confidence in me as Veal Lorimer in the director's chair. One thing I learned, I guess, or uh, I think it was Spacefall. I was listening to some Blake 7 podcast recently, and I think it was Spacefall, but I can't exactly remember who it was. It might have been Blake 7 in character. Pretty sure it was Spacefall, though. They point out that when Terry Nation writes, Avon and Blake get along more. Yeah. That's actually something I wanted to talk about is that Blake and Avon seem like in this episode they got along a lot better than they have this season. But we're going to get there because there are scenes that we need to see first before I talk about that. <laughs> so this story begins kind of in the middle of of a rebellion of some sort on some planet we've never seen before or probably right. even heard the of Federation on the Federation is getting completely destroyed or, well, <laughs> well you know, mm. no, it's 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 not as one sided as I'm making it out to be, but they're getting attacked by this group. Yeah, well, and, well, like I said, the rebels, right? Yeah. They're rebelling, and the Federation is down to what appears to be three men. <laughs> well, they retreat sort of into this room as their ranks are thinned, I guess. And one of the, the one of the guys presses this button that he looks very hesitant to press. Well, he basically commands the other guy to shut the door. This scene was kind of funny, actually. He yells to the guy sitting near the door. He's like, hey, close the door. And the guy's like, what? He's like, close the door. So he's like, oh, okay. He stands up and closes the door. And this guy in command, I think his name, I think he was called like the sub commander or something like that. Basically reveals that they're going to have to use the weapon. He just refers to it like as the weapon or the bomb or something like that. And the other guy's like, are you sure about this? Because the guy's like, there's a 93% chance that the rebels are going to overwhelm us and we're not going to win. The guy's like, well, that's high enough for me to use this weapon. And the guy's like, there's still a 7% chance we could turn the tide. And the guy's like, yeah, I'm not taking those odds. Well, they activate it. They eventually activate it. And it starts a countdown that starts counting down from 999. And the guy who presses it gets gunned down because the rebels break in and kill him. Yeah. Maybe we should mention how it starts at 999 instead of any reasonable number, something like 120. Nine hundred. Well, it's not seconds. It's it's definitely not seconds. It's slower than seconds. It's like one every two and a half seconds or something. Yeah, which makes it even worse because that means this timer has to be like thirty to forty minutes long. Yeah, which I guess is to give people time to escape to get the out planets. to GTFO. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a five second countdown. <laughs> it just it makes it makes me think of the countdown on the Nostromo and Alien. It's like it. It's like a 15-minute countdown, but you can only stop it up until five minutes before the countdown is going to end. And then uh, Sigourney Weaver's character Ripley only gets to the countdown like right as the, fu- <laughs> the 10-minute mark passes. It's like, dang it, I can't stop it now. Wasn't there a countdown in Alien Resurrection as well? I think so, yeah. Probably. The second best Alien movie? You mean the worst Alien movie. <laughs> it's better than Aliens in Alien 3. Just That's saying, a lie. Just saying. That's a lie. Go check out our Triple Play episode for more on that. We have a movie trilogy podcast called Triple Play. That's what we're referring to. What if all our podcasts are just platforms to plug all our other podcasts? Whoa. Well, they are Everything is way. connected. Check out Trust Your Doctor where we discussed that concept or discussed it like two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so. Like 20 minutes ago in, court, in terms of recording. I think then we actually cut to Blake and his crew. Well, the people who break into the room uh, are in disbelief that they actually activated this countdown. So obviously this is something bad. Yeah. And then we get a humorous scene where the one guy's like, well, I think I can disarm it. They're like, okay, we'll do it. So he pulls out this cable and like wire cutters and just cuts this cable and the timer stops. And then it like jumps sec- and then it counts down to 20 in like two seconds. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he just speeds it up. No. That is a trope in some movies. Huh. Uh, where the the hero tries to stop the bomb and then in doing so accidentally speed it up. It happens quite a lot in television, modern day television, I mean, where, you know, in my opinion, like modern television is a lot more oriented towards, I guess, adrenaline. people. (laughs) Well, (laughs) that's a rather crude way to put it, but like adrenaline, like everything has to be high octane action. 
or high drama, right? Everything has to be always at maximum. Well, it, everything just has to be quick, and that's just the nature of, like, the world we live in now, right? Things are getting mm -hmm. quicker. So, like, you know, modern television is more likely now when the hero cuts the wire, instead of stopping, the time is going to speed up, or it'll stop, and then they'll speed up. And at this point, like, it's, it's more surprising when a hero cuts the wire and the bomb just stops and it just works. And he's like, yep, I did it. Because, you know, everything has to be high suspense. There has to be more suspense. You know, and there's, there's this race throughout the course of the episode to try and build as much suspense as possible. So when you get to the end of the episode, when they're going to defuse the bomb and you still have 10 minutes left, you're like, well, how can we make this more suspenseful? Make it more suspenseful by speeding up the, the, the bomb, by making the danger closer. Make it more suspenseful by melting all the ice and having them crushed under rubble. <sighs> Spoilers. I really liked that scene, though. But but that doesn't happen here, which I appreciated. I actually liked that they cut it and just nothing really happened. I mean, it stopped for a second, and but then it just continued at the same pace. It didn't, like, speed up. Yeah, he gave it his best shot. They weren't penalized for trying is basically what I liked about this. Sure. All right. And then we see Blake and his crew. And... And once again, Jenna and Callie are the ones operating the teleport system. <laughs> I mean, Orak can operate the teleport system. So really... Orak and Zen are not even in this episode. Orak is in this episode, actually. Zen is not in this episode, but Orak is Orak in this episode. I being in this. They, they analyze the, the oh, right, data with Orak. Right, yeah. They analyze the schematics for the, for the explosion device with Orak because the people on the surface reveal that the reason why cutting the wire didn't stop the bomb is because that thing in the room is just like a containment unit for the counter. Or... Which is somewhere else on the planet. Yeah, the bomb should... is somewhere else. And they also in this sort of explain the situation, right? There are these rebels who are going up against the Federation because Federation has, as as we've seen in the past, you know, in stories like Mission to Destiny, and uh, there's another major one that I'm forgetting where the Federation did this, but they've tried to either take planets by force or do it sort of covertly by the mechanisms of politics, supposedly, right? But they're really just sort of underhandedly in... It was the one where they tried to institute the puppet president. Right, uh, Bounty. Bounty. They're, uh, what they're really doing is imperializing these yeah. planets. That's not a word. And they but... did it, uh, what was the episode before Pressure Point? The one where everybody got captured in exactly the same way when they beamed down to the planet. Oh, Horizon. Hor yeah, yeah, Horizon, Horizon. was, was a, another one where they instituted a puppet government. And like we said in the Horizon episode, Horizon was one where they actually succeeded in doing what they were trying to do in Bounty. So it was kind of, in that way, an interesting uh, reversal where we saw the Federation had actually succeeded at well, something. Succeeded for, for a time, right? At the end yeah. of the episode, you know, he comes back. But uh, then again, the Federation is probably going to come back in full force and just crush them. But I mean, hey, yeah, but the nature of this show is, is that, that we don't have to deal with that anymore. That, but also the nature of Blake 7 is that at the end of the episode, the Federation has to be defeated. That doesn't mean that someone like really? Serverland, in, in my opinion, the, at the end of the episode, the Federation as a concept has to be defeated. That doesn't mean what? necessarily that Serverland or Travis has to be defeated. It just means that as, a, as an entity, the Federation needs to be defeated in some way. In my opinion, that's what has to huh. happen at the end of a Blake 7 episode. Let's think. Does that always happen? Sure, in Horizon, yeah, it does. The, the only episode you could argue that it doesn't, and I would actually probably agree with you, is Pressure Point. Because in that episode, Gan dies, the computer wasn't on the planet, and Blake does no damage to the Federation at all. But, but at the same time, Servaland, that's Servaland and Travis's sort of break. That's what I was going to say. But at the same time, Servaland and Travis break from each other, and that's, in a way, a victory for Blake, and in a way, the Federation does lose in that aspect. Yeah, I mean, thinking back on all the season A episodes, right, the first four that all had the Federation, mm -hmm. yeah, they all sort of, well, actually Spacefall didn't have the Federation, did it? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I mean, they had, the, they had the crew of the London, but... Yeah. And yeah, uh, see, Cloakate get destroyed, Travis definitely got yeah. owned. <laughs> Project Avalon. Yep. They yeah, get yeah you're pretty much correct, that, right? They conceptually, at the end of the episode, are defeated. Mm -hmm. in some way i mean that's not to say that that'll happen for the rest of the show right that's not to say no at it's some not to point say it at all the federation can't win at the end of the episode 
And if there was ever going to be an episode where the Federation won, I think that they've set themselves up pretty well for it to be a season finale because that would be a huge shock. Like the Federation wins at the end of the season. Then you're like, well, what's going to happen now? Because we're so ingrained in this idea that the Federation ha- has to be defeated at the end of the episode that for an episode to end with the Federation winning would be a huge well, shock. Well, you'll see what happens at the end of this season. This story introduces Star One as a destination mm-hmm. that they need to get to mm-hmm. a little bit later. Yeah. Because right now, we're, uh, like we were talking about, they introduce, they bring up their sort of commander, whose name I'm unfortunately forgetting. Sergeant Sel... Okay, Major Provine. No, Provine was the antagonist. Ca- Ca- yeah. Cotter? Cotter? Cotter is the head of the rebels. Yeah. So, so Cotter, I guess, I think, tells them that the Federation has sort of overtaking their planet. And this time, they have this like super weapon that they're holding over everyone's heads, Mm -hmm. which is basically this thing that's going to activate when the countdown ends, which will uh, destroy the planet. Basically it'll create some sort of fallout that'll kill everything on the planet, on the planet, but then be totally, the planet will be totally safe again within a matter of a very short amount of time, Mm -hmm. which will leave the planet open to the Federation to be able to come there and do whatever they want with it. And Blake says, as usual, the Federation cares more about, uh, goods than human life or whatever. Yeah, yeah, like I was gonna say, it's kind of this idea that the Federation land is more important than people. That having yeah, just like real land life, right? is, is more important than having people in the land, having people to rule over. It doesn't matter if you if you have the land. But then uh, no, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I'm just no, saying that, that the that, tail end of what you just said, but hey, I'm just saying that's what it seems like they're setting up the Federation to believe, or that they'll. Maybe not that they don't care about having anyone to rule over, right? Because what's their, what is the Federation without like, and this again, I mean, I know we brought up like power theory, I think in Spacefall, mm-hmm. just in a completely different context, but what is like your, what is power, I guess then like, if you don't have the ability to control the resources and hold it over someone else, I don't know. I don't really don't know what I'm getting at, but I think hey. we talked about it in Bounty too. It was like, if you don't have people to rule over then what is power i guess it, it, power only exists in relation to other people i think is kind of what we talked about well i usually and i, and I think certain theorists do too uh, refer to power as like the ability to control resources mm-hmm. which hey i don't know <laughs> i mean see that definition that definition would seem to indicate that the Federation wouldn't care about having people to rule over. They would only care about the land that the planet provides or that the, the territory that owning the planet. But what's, over, what, right? what good is the ability to control resources without people, without people, I without, guess, without, I, without I, no, something I to use yeah, the resources see, no. for, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, you use the resources for yourself too, but Hey, look, I really don't know what, uh, what any of this is getting at, but anyway, so they Blake says Avon can probably disarm the bomb because he's a computer expert. Oh yeah, Villa gets to use his lock breaking <laughs> skills when they arrive on the planet. Right, Villa has some more snarky lines on this. Uh not as snarky as usual, probably because Terry Nation wrote <laughs> this episode. Sure, and I know Terry Nation wasn't a big Villa fan. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean I'm sure after I'm sure the Federation would populate the planet again. I mean probably. The question about the Federation is, 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 I guess the question that's being, that we should be asking is why the Federation needs all this land, right? Why are they okay with killing everybody on this planet and then getting the planet back? Do they just want the resources yeah, on the planet? What? Who knows if the Federation is even okay with this weapon? Well, I mean, we've seen people within the Federation who are sort of on the fringes, like in Horizon. So we mm-hmm. don't know if they're necessarily in constant communication with the quote unquote home areas of the federation earth star i guess one. star one so who knows what's really going on with the authorization of you in itself so and obviously the the provine and the rest of them were hesitant to use it because of their own lives but hey yeah well like i said it begs the question why does the federation want this planet is it because they want to rule the people on it or do they just need somewhere to put like their own people do they just want to take their own people and put them here and be like here you go here's somewhere for you to live or do they want the resources on the planet well i guess we don't know right i don't think in this episode they indicate why this planet specifically is important to the federation right but so avon avon knows del grant this mercenary they've hired to 
help them out. Yeah, who apparently knows his way around the explosive system in some capacity and can help Avon disarm it. Avon's like, if it's the Del Grant that I know, really hope I don't meet him because if I do meet him, he might kill me because last time we met, he promised he would kill me if we met again. And Blake's like, um, <laughs> and Avon's like, there's nothing. Don't worry about it. You just forget it. And Blake's like, oh, he's right. clearly important if he had this effect on you. And Avon's like, no, don't worry about it. It's fine. Wanted to touch on Jenna and Callie again because this is, I mean, I've justified Jenna and Callie sitting at the teleport controls and not doing anything before whether that's a good thing or not mm-hmm. me justifying it that is <laughs> but here like I'm, I'm i'm starting to see you know when the when you read interviews with the cast especially sally nevette saying like oh we were just delegated to the sidelines we were just or or not we she, like i was just the quote-unquote pretty face to look at who operates the controls and that's it i'm starting to see like where that's coming from right I mean, it's hard when you have a cast this big to make everyone seem useful, especially, I think, in the way that Blake 7 was set up and that they didn't give everyone... The same a, amount a, of character? Well, I was going to say a specialization because where I was going to go with this was like, you look at Star Trek Enterprise, which I've been watching a lot recently and I bring up a lot on this show. You have six, seven main characters, but... The thing about the people on, on Star Trek Enterprise is that everybody has like a certain role that they fulfill. So if something related to that role comes up in the episode, then it's obvious that they're, they're going to fulfill it, right? You have Travis, who's the pilot. So he pilots the ship. Hoshi translates. Captain Archer is the captain. Flox is the doctor. Travis is, the, not Travis, Tucker is the head engineer. Uh, T'Pol is the science officer. So if there's sure. anything that falls into one of those fields, you know who's going to fulfill it, and then you can easily write in something into that episode that that person will do, right? Sure. So what I'm trying to say is maybe Blake 7 is a little bit undermined by the fact that not everybody has like a specialization, except Jenna, who was introduced Villa. as someone with a pilot who can pilot the ship. Villa is a locksmith, and Avon has computer Gan skills. was the brawn, basically. And so like Jenna was introduced as this pilot, but now at this point, it seems like everybody can pilot the Liberator, and even Zen pilots the Liberator sometimes. So... You know, the fact that not everybody has like a set role anymore may be part of the reason why it seems like there's not Well look, I mentioned this on a lot for them uh, to do. I mean, I mentioned this on Twitter recently, is that what I really sort of would want to see more of is things like Shadow or the first or sorry, second half of Bounty, where the episode focuses a lot on one or maybe even two characters. And then has sort of the rest of the characters be sort of supporting, in supporting roles for that episode at least, right? Like we've got Shadow, mm-hmm. and Callie was a big part of that episode, sort of maybe the, you might say the main character of that episode, and the rest of the characters were, you know, doing their own thing and stuff. But yeah, we're, we're there to support like what was going on also with Callie. And look at the second half of Bounty, the same thing is basically true with Jenna. Mm-hmm. So that's something I would want to see more of. But but, instead, they just keep focusing on Avon and Blake, which is cool because Avon is like a cool character and and so is Blake. But especially in this, I like Avon was really cool in this and was really interesting getting more of his backstory. But at the same Mm -hmm. time, I just want a more sort of even distribution. Yeah, well, I think that's uh, probably a pitfall that Blake Seven has actually fallen into with an ensemble show making two people kind of the lead and focusing on them and everybody else is, is just that is just the ensemble instead of doing what would probably be better of, of having like character pieces each week that focus on a single right. character and everyone exactly. else serves as a background character which is what you're saying and I agree. Oh well <laughs> well i mean that's not to say that like blake seven has been a bad show no no it's just kind of sidelined callie and jenna which is a shame because i think the show could be better if it focused more on Callie and Jenna not to say it's not good already yeah no I mean like I know I've said it before but like I mostly watch cartoons I like cartoons a lot more than live action stuff (laughs) say what you will about that but Blake 7 is one of the few like live action shows that I really not not only because we're doing this podcast but also just because I like really enjoy watching it that Mm -hmm. I like actually sit down look forward to watching and don't like halfway through the episode say like man I really wish I was watching a cartoon right now Right, and I, I really enjoyed Blake 7, which when we started the show surprised me because it wasn't a show what? that had ever been on my radar and I watched the first episode. No, it's it had like, been on our radar for like years. Of, okay, been on our radar in terms of podcasts, like but I mean like least. personally, right? Because I watch quite a bit of television. It was never like, oh, Blake 7 is the next TV show I should watch. 
And the first episode, I think I talked about it in our first episode, you know, the way back, like, didn't really impress me a lot. But anyway. Wow. <laughs> anyway, Del Grant shows up. Yeah, <laughs> Del Grant shows up. Avon is like, got his face behind his hand. <laughs> Avon's like hiding behind Blake, like, Blake, you gotta save me, dude. I'll owe you one after this. They have like an icy confrontation. Haha, <laughs> get it, icy. What? No, I don't get it. Because there's ice later oh, on. Wow. All right. I see. I see. You see. We all see. I don't know. So Avon, I, they kind of talk and Blake says, look, we have bigger problems to deal with right now. You two can sort out your little issue later. But if you don't sort out this bomb, this planet will be uninhabitable and everyone's going to die. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, okay. Meanwhile, uh, what's his face? One of the Federation crew, whose name I Provine, I Provine think. is wandering through the halls. He's escaped. He's mm-hmm. blended in, I guess. Right. He goes to. We didn't mention that when Blake, Avon, and Villa first show up, they find this like rocket launch area or something mm. along those lines. And this is where Provine goes because he wants to get the heck out of there. Right. And he's confronted, I think, by one of the rebels. Yeah, and he kind of knocks him out. There's tries, a scuffle. He tries to bargain with the the guy saying like, hey, you and me can make it out of here. But the guy's too committed to his cause to really go along with Provine. And it looks like he's going to bring Provine back to his leader or whatever. But that doesn't, that doesn't, no, that doesn't happen. Provine knocks him out mm-hmm. and takes his uniform. Right. What's interesting is Provine has a different gun than everyone else. That's not interesting. That I, That's actually to be expected, right? Because he's part of the Federation. <laughs> the interesting part is that this gun is really long. Mm-hmm. And... Reminds me of Imapak, kind of. Sure. Uh, yeah, almost, I guess. But uh, later on, and we'll get to this scene, but might as well just bring it up now. Provine is pretending to be one of the guards stationed right outside the command center. Mm-hmm. And... You don't know, I think, that it's him yet, but you can see he's his face is turned away from the camera. He's standing, you know, his back facing the camera. And you can see that he's holding this, like, really long gun that none of the other people are holding. So, like, oh, that's Provine. I thought yeah. that was a nice touch. Well, so, while this is going on, the Rebels are, like, looking through all of the ID cards of all the Federation officers and all the Federation officers in the system that were assigned to the base because they want to make sure that everybody's accounted for actually very smart and it's basically never seen on any other episode of television show unprecedented this is unprecedented <laughs> levels of intelligence here and 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 it actually comes into play later on not very effectively thanks to villa but anyway <laughs> yeah well the problem is right now is that None of this is being disseminated yet, mm-hmm. which isn't a pro- uh, which isn't default, you know, uh, Cotter or whatever his name is, or Blake or anyone, right? They don't have time to disseminate this information because Provine is walking past people in the hall, like <laughs> supping people and... It's sup, dude. <laughs> hey, remember? We had lunch like a week ago. <laughs> and none of them recognize him. Obviously. Which is fine. Yeah, I mean... They don't recognize him because he's exactly. a Federation officer, but also the fact that even if he was a rebel, that they didn't recognize him would be fine because it's a big rebel cause and it's not expected you know everyone. Right, yeah. So, so Avon and Del Grant come up with this plan to disable the bomb, but they, but they need more information on the schematics, so they beam up to the Liberator to go analyze the schematics through ORAC, I think is what happens. Right, they let Del Grant on the Liberator, I think. Mm-hmm. They definitely let him on at the end. I'm pretty sure they do here as well. Yeah, they do. And he goes up because then Callie, well, so he introduces not, her to Jenna, him to Jenna, sorry. Right. And not, then he introduces her, him to Callie as well. Not, I don't know why I made so much big of a deal about that because it's not like they've had a problem bringing people on the Liberator in the past. Yeah. It's just like an open door policy. <laughs> like, he just come on in. So they, they get the information from ORAC. And then I think we receive a few pieces of information about why they hate each other or not actually why they hate each other, why Grant hates Avon specifically. Yeah, it's sort of interspersed throughout all of this, but right before Avon was captured and, you know, imp- I guess imprisoned or confined, brought to confinement for the crime he committed that got him sent to Cygnus Alpha, mm-hmm. is that he knew this woman whose name Named, I'm forgetting. It began with an A. I remember that much. It, Anna. Right, he knew this woman, Anna, and he and a couple other people were planning on 
fleeing mm-hmm. the city or wherever they were after their just a city. heist scheme thing. And they needed passport like papers. Mm-hmm. They needed some forged identification or whatever. But the if I remember correctly, the person Avon who who's gonna hook up Avon with the stuff he needed to get out mm-hmm. was bought out by the Federation. But he did hook Avon up with the passes. That was the thing. Avon got the passes, and then he killed the guy who gave him the passes because he found out he had been right. Avon shot sold first, out. and then in the process of escaping to get back to his group, Avon got ambushed by some Federation guards, and he got shot, and he was bleeding out. Or he got shot when he was killing the merchant or yeah, whatever. Yeah, this reminds me of Spike and Vicious and Julie on Cowboy Bebop. And then he basically was knocked out for 35 hours. And then he found out that Anna died and he left He left when he found out that she was dead, basically. Right. And um, but he doesn't actually and, explain all of this until a little bit later. No, he doesn't. And Grant is holding it against him because he feels that Avon is responsible for Anna's death. Right. So they... Beam back down from the Liberator. They, yeah, they find out that the, the actual mechanism that's going to release this... Th- See, I don't even remember what it was. It was... The mechanism some, some like sort of radiation. And it's, it's, it's like on the... Located in the polar ice caps or something. That was the other thing they needed to get from the Liberator, actually, was um, like Location thermal lances oh. to cut through the ice. And their thermal suits. They uh, make use of the thermal suits again. Yeah, thank goodness. They turn up the heat. Like, well, well, the heat actually comes into play in a little bit. Yeah, so then Blake tells them, hey, look, if you're not done by the time the countdown gets to 50, we're beaming you out. We're beaming everyone out. And Avon says, all not right. Not everyone, just Avon just, and, and Just Grant. Avon, Grant, Blake, and Villa. Yeah, and then they, Blake says he can actually take a few of the uh, Resistance members with him, but not everyone. I mean, they have a lot of teleported bracelets. Right, so I didn't know, like, was this some sort of policy he was... Like, we can't really intervene that much, or, I mean, I don't, like, really... He's doing the Star Trek nope. thing. We're not allowed to intervene in, na- in native culture. Yeah, but, like, also the thing is, these are people who know Blake, or know of him, mm-hmm. at least, and are also rebels themselves. Right, because they pull a gun on Blake when he comes in, and they're like, oh, you're Blake. Yeah. The the guy who's giving a federation of on yep. thorn in his side. Avon and Grant get to this room, and there's just a solid it's pack a of minor ice. thorn, though. <laughs> a solid pack of ice they got to get through. So they're trying to cut through it with a pickaxe. Avon's trying to cut through it with a pickaxe, and it's not working. Yeah. So he pulls out a space heater, and he's just like, Haha, space heater. Yeah, so that, that was something I wanted to bring up because I didn't know if it was sort of a Terry Nationism, like it's a space heater. or Because a space heater is a real thing, right? right. Like a, a, mm-hmm. a small heater that heats up a, a defined space. So it's kind of funny, I guess. So they eventually melt through the ice, to get into the... There's kind of this this antechamber, I guess, where the, the bomb is stored. And they get into the room and they start working on the bomb. And basically the rest of the episode is just Avon and and Del. Right, Grant. the final sort of 10 minutes. But this was this was actually the best part of the episode. Yeah, it was. Uh, although it's not the entirety of the rest of the episode no, because not. Blake goes to go find something. Pro, well, they deal with Provine. Basically, yeah. Blake goes to find something, and Provine finds Blake. But at the and, same and time, they go send Villa to go sort out the situation, I believe. But he gets lost because they because the lady the rebel who I don't remember her name right, realizes the one who got knocked out and, and nearly killed. We skipped the entire part where they go through the secret passages and deduce that Provine is still wandering around the corridors. But that's it's existent. just that it's, it's, it's yeah. exactly that. But she like looks through the Federation. She's looking through the Federation thing to confirm everybody's accounted for. And she said, oh, this is the guy who knocked me out. He's not a rebel. He's, he's a Federation officer. Go <laughs> tell Blake, Villa. Of course, Villa... <sighs> he mixes up the uh, corridor Villa numbers. gets lost on the way to Blake. But Blake, he sees Provine walk into a room and then a gunshot. And he's like, oh, no. And then he sees Provine's body fall. And he's like, whew, safe. And he's like, Blake, that guy's a Federation officer. And Blake's like, yeah. I know. I he just f- tried to I kill me. that. But Provine gives them a key piece of information right before he dies. Uh, he tells them that Federation command has been moved to Star One. Yeah. Blake. But then classically dies right before he can reveal anything else, whether he would have or not. There's a death in this that I thought was kind of hilarious. I think it's by a rebel at the beginning. He's an old guy and he's like dying. And then he just dies in like the most unbelievable I guess way possible because it was just kind of poorly acted and he just goes Ugh. and that's it and he just freezes and dies and yeah the guy's like, I remember what you're talking about yeah 
It was all right. Like it, it was you know, all right. Whatever. I only bring it up now because Provine's death was like way better acted. Well, I mean, Provine's a main character, or a named person at least, and not just you know a guy dying. So Blake and Villa, I think, notice that the time is getting low, and they beam up to the Liberator. So they beam up when it gets to fifty, like they planned. But Avon and uh, Grant have decided that they're going to stake everything because they've already come this far and they've already activated the mechanism, at least part of it. Mm-hmm. So they throw their teleport... They decide to take their teleport bracelets off, but they really up the stakes here by throwing them into water, making them totally... I don't know why they did that. Because, like, they were going to need those teleport bracelets to get off the planet after they defuse the bomb, right? Well, I mean, I think it was just a case of, you know, if we don't... If we fail this, you know, we're going we're gonna to do this or we're going to die trying. So we don't need... If, if we succeed... We'll be we'll be beamed up by the Liberator. I guess it's just a waste of teleporter braces, right. in my opinion. Especially maybe, since last season they got so low. <laughs> maybe they didn't mean to throw them in the water. Maybe they just meant to throw them on the floor, and they just happened to land in a puddle. And they're like, "Oh shoot, we've just screwed ourselves. We can't put them back on." Maybe I was going to put them on, mine back on when we had like two seconds left. <laughs> yeah, Avon. <laughs> Avon's like, "Oh shoot, I was going to put mine back on right at fifty and leave you here, <laughs> but like, ooh, now." Now I'm not able to do that. <laughs> but the mechanism that they have to work with is kind of interesting because they have to... There's these three tubes and they Four, have... Four, I think. I'm pretty sure... It doesn't matter, but I'm pretty sure it was three. Pretty sure I'm right here. <laughs> it doesn't matter, like you said. Yeah. Uh, and they have to activate... They have to get the cylinder inside each tube to sort of fall, but not completely. So, well, they so they're going to gonna fall... The thing is they were going to fall and that would activate the bomb. So they needed to stop them from falling through the tube so they like drill a hole through yeah, the tube and was. then put like a little metal Rod. pipe through it except they like try to hide the fact that they're just using an industrial drill they bought from like the home improvement <laughs> store by like not showing it and then overlaying a, a sci-fi impression. sound effect nah, over the drill i didn't get that in the impression that, that okay was i don't the think case, they were trying but... to hide it but they were definitely trying to make it seem more sci-fi futuristic by playing this sci-fi drill sound over the, <laughs> the sure, drilling i don't even remember what it sounds like but sure I just think it's kind of funny because I've been around drills my entire life since my dad's a woodworker. I mean, we're around drills right now because we're recording this. In his in- woodworking studio? Yeah. Well, they're they're able to successfully complete two of the three or three of the four or whatever it is. There's one but- left is the point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the ice melting has caused a bunch of other problems. First of all, they're getting doused by water. Which is never a condition you want to work under. I mean, except if you're you know, in extremely specific fields. Like underwater basket weaving. Like underwater welding. Also, underwater welding pays a lot of money. You also die in like 10 years. You know, you Probably start doing why it, it pays and you so die much 10 money. years later. I knew well, this guy. I had a cousin of a cousin who was going to become an underwater welder. and don't know if he actually did. He might be dead now if he did. Yeah, you know, maybe you're... I mean, yeah, I don't want to be morbid. I don't want to seem like I'm desensitized I mean, I didn't know him. depersonalized from death. Oh, God. Just your doctor. Uh, but he might be dead. Yeah, maybe. But but it, there, th- there's this, also some... There, there's also a cave-in situation. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering why they didn't just melt all the ice and short-circuit the bomb. But that's neither here nor there. Mm, yeah, maybe it's not an option. You know, who knows? Whatever. Maybe Avon just didn't think about it. I mean, it might be a case of trying to come up with a plan so complicated that you ignore the obvious which is something that happens to me a lot on like physics tests when i'm like how can i solve this problem i come up with the most complicated solution possible and then after the test like ah it was so easy all i had to do was like blah 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 and it would have been done in like five seconds that's that's the classic test thing right you turn in the you have a problem you're stuck on you're like well whatever i'm just going to do it to the best of my ability you turn Mm -hmm. the test in two seconds after you do that yeah you you know the answer yeah (laughs) i mean it's just like you overthink the problem and you get you get so railroaded into your train of thought that you haha, railroaded into train of thought. You get so railroaded into your train of thought wow. that you f- refuse to consider any other option, including ones that may be simpler, and you just like completely look over them, not by choice, just accidentally. Or you know, maybe it's a problem of Avon. this. Sure, maybe it's a problem of Avon, <laughs> or maybe it's a problem of this concept is never problematized, problematized by the show. So whatever, and that's what I kind of think it is. But hey, Grant gets crushed by steel beams. Sure. I mean, sure. not, I mean, yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah, he does. You sound like we're writing a story and I'm just like, well, next, Grant will get crushed by sh- steel beams. Yeah, sure. Why not? 
But he is. He actually is crushed by beams, and Avon tries to at save that, him, and in the process gets crushed by a steel beam himself. Yeah, at that point, I was like, Grant's not making it out of this alive. There's no way he's making it out of this alive. Plot I would, twist. I would have bet money at that point that he wasn't making it out of alive. Damn, why wasn't, where was I when you were watching this? <laughs> I would have taken that bet. Really? He, you would have thought Grant would have made it out, was going to make it out alive? Yes, Del Grant sounds like a very important name for some well, reason. We have Del Tarrant coming right. up. And we've had Dev Tarrant as well. I don't think we actually ever mentioned it because I don't think we knew at the time, but Tarrant. We mentioned uh, oh no, it. Oh, no, we mentioned it with Sergeant Drano. We mentioned it with Drano. On Pressure Point. But we'll just mention it again. Tarrant was a nickname of Terry Nation in high school or college or something like that, which is why it appears so much on the it's show. Kind of a really weird nickname. I think it's in some of the other stuff he's written as well. I wonder if that's just his name specifically or maybe where he was is like a regional nickname. Because I know, like, Robert in some places in Sweden is nicknamed Roban. Huh. It's interesting. If my information is accurate, which it may very well not be. <laughs> anyway, Avon is able to use a small metal piece, piece of the of wall. The girder, which fits perfectly through <laughs> the hole he drilled in the final tube and stops it from falling. He's like, whew, we did it. They had one second to spare. Didn't There's think also, they'd go for the classic well, one second to spare. Not necessarily one second because, like we said, the counts or, or, were Yeah, the count's on one. We, there's a scene where Blake is with the crew of the Liberator and they're like panicking that Avon's about to, that Avon's about to die, which surprised me that they actually cared so much. It's like, oh, I'm touched you care. Well, I mean, okay, so Avon, and I've mentioned this in the past, but Avon sort of puts up this front, right, where he doesn't actually, he, he pretends not to care about anything. He pretends to be, pretends to care, you know, about two things, basically, mm-hmm. himself and money. Well, I, Which what, is basically just himself because he needs, he wants the money for his own purposes or whatever but it's it's shown he's shown at least i think time and time again that he's willing to put himself in danger and go to great lengths for blake and the rest of the crew as well i mean this is kind of tying into what i wanted to talk about how when terry nation writes avon and blake they're a lot more friendly than they are when they're written by someone else which yep. is also surprising because this season terry nation wrote uh, redemption which was kind of the first episode that introduced more of a rivalry between Avon and Blake. And it's something that we've mentioned, I think, consistently throughout the season, that it seems like in Series B, Avon is becoming a lot more antagonistic towards Blake and is making a lot more passes at Blake uh, and how Blake is an ineffectual leader and how Avon thinks he could do better. And Blake has himself become more fanatical as time has gone on. Right. But this Maybe episode... Maybe not in this episode. I supposed to say, this episode seems almost like a reversion to Series A, Blake and Avon. Because uh, Blake barely ever actually makes any suggestions that are out of the realm of sanity. Common sense. <laughs> right. You know, he says, oh, when the timer gets down to 50, we're going to beam you out. You know, we're, we're going to try beam as many people out as possible. Yeah, this could very well have come earlier in the season. You know, maybe just throw Gan in there, have him be off in another room as he... Learning often... from Orac. <laughs> yeah. And it would have worked perfectly. Gan is forever learning from Orac and Still miss hearts. him. I still miss him. I, I really do. It's surprising how little I feel like the show has changed since Gan has left, which is probably a testament to how little Gan actually did when he was on the show. Yeah, yeah. But, like, I was going to say, in this episode, Avon, like, barely makes any passes at Blake at all. In fact, he seems almost like Blake is his best friend, especially when he's talking about Del Grant and how Del Grant is going to kill him, and Blake's like, well, he must have had an effect on you. (laughs) Oh, we didn't mention the reason why this episode made me lose the game, which if you don't know what the game is, just look it up. You'll probably regret it. But the reason why this made me lose the game is... Just lost the other game. Oh, Jesus. For the first time in really like almost a year probably since I've lost the game. Wasn't it an episode of Doctor Who that made you lose the game lost? Yeah, maybe a couple months ago or something. I used to lose it like every 30 minutes, but hey, is that Grant... As it looks like him and Avon are about to die, says, you know, we something along the lines of, we bet big and we just lost the game. I was like, really? <laughs> yeah, well, they get beamed up to the Liberator. <laughs> just the wanted to the point story. that out. Yeah, I mean. Well, well, Grant wonders why Avon stayed behind to save him or something like that. Yeah, because. And it's, because, because, it's because it's revealed that, what's her face? Anna. Anna. Is Grant's sister. And also Avon was in love with her. He doesn't say it, but it's pretty obvious. It's phrased kind of strangely because, you know, it would have made more sense to me if Avon had said, uh, because you're Anna's brother. Whereas mm-hmm. he actually says, because maybe because maybe it's because Anna was your sister. 
Well, I think it's because Avon had feelings for Anna, right? Sure. Avon actually liked Anna. Avon cared about Anna. <laughs> Avon probably hard to believe loved Anna. He seems really torn up about her dying when he's talking about her death. And this is probably the first episode where Avon has shown any emotion oh, except for arrogance. Right? He's like actually well, I mean, sad and torn up about the fact that this woman is dead. Sure, but like like we mentioned, he him. always he jumps into danger to save all of them. I mean he obviously has some sort right. of he 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 cares about them on some level or he cares about maybe, them. Maybe maybe to the extent that they help guarantee his survival for the time being well but, but what I, i'm saying is like he never actually shows that like on his face right he's always he always looks smug or arrogant yeah even, even yeah. when he, I mean, he's right. saving them but in like these scenes where he's talking about anna he actually looks like distressed and sad and upset about it yeah which is probably why he refers to grant as anna's brother or anna as as your sister instead of by saying oh you're her brother or whatever right, but it's, it's, he's reframing it around anna yeah he is reframing it around anna because the common response to that or the response i would have expected from that would be because he, you know he asked why did you save me well because you're anna's brother mm-hmm. right makes a little more sense in terms of uh grammar of it semantics of it i don't know what you'd call it but hey semantics probably yeah so this really was more of an avon episode than anything yeah it was looking back on it i didn't actually like this episode much when really? I watched it, I really when liked I it. watched it, huh. looking back on it, I'm liking it more and more as we actually talk about it because I'm realizing it did a lot of like things that I actually really liked. Yeah, like there's a actually lot. a lot going on in this episode, and I, I I was listening to last week's episode, not Killer, Hostage. Hostage. Did you uh, say Killer because I accidentally said Killer when I sent you the text maybe, that I finished maybe, editing it? Maybe, maybe, but <laughs> I was listening to that to do the show notes for it, and I remember. It I said, like, yeah, there wasn't really much going on in this episode. And then I listened to our episode and I thought back to Hostage as well. And I was like, that's not true. There's a lot going on in Hostage. Yeah, it's interesting. A lot of the Blake 7 episodes now, you know, I'm liking them more as we actually go back and look at them in retrospect. When I immediately came out of the episode, I was like, oh, that episode was just okay. It was mediocre. It was just good, but not great. But like looking back on them, I'm like, oh, there's a lot that that was done in that episode that I really liked. You know, I actually really enjoyed that episode like this one in particular like i probably place this as maybe my third maybe second favorite of the season after shadow at least well there's also a lot of stuff in this that is sort of a build-up regardless of the star one stuff which is obvious but there's stuff character stuff in this that is a build-up to what's going to happen a little bit later on Mm -hmm. in this season which i'm not going to spoil i know they never mind i know what star one is because I know basically every major spoiler from here until the end of the show. I only know what, what that Star One was Federation Come On because I looked up, I was looking up things when we were trying to come up with the name of this podcast. <laughs> right. I don't know. I you know, that kind of ties into my ranking for this episode, which in a in a break from normality, I think I'll go first. My ranking for this episode was or is uh, when Avon first cuts the wire. And he's holding it, and then Grant says, oh, the rest from here is pretty straightforward. You want me to do it? And Avon gives us really resigned, like, oh, go ahead. <laughs> and that is my ranking for this story. Just like, at first glance, I was just like, uh, this story was just, eh. But then, you know, as time goes on, I, I like it more and more. And throughout the course of just this episode of this podcast, I've liked it more than when I started this recording. <laughs> kind of like how Avon and Grant became less enemy less They're less like antagonistic they reconciled over the course of their time working on the bomb so, <laughs> for 10 minutes working on the bomb yeah yeah so that's my ranking for this episode it start, sure. starts it started off as a eh, it's just okay you know uh, go ahead I, and avon's resigned go ahead and then it grew into uh well why did you save my life <laughs> <laughs> all right mine, mine mine is actually kind of similar to that i rated this one a travis's character development right because <laughs> Initially, it seemed kind of strange, right? They were bringing Avon, who, I mean, even though I've mentioned that he's had a conscience previously, it's still a little bit strange to think of Avon as, you know, this character who really, like, deeply cares for someone. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I was like, oh, what kind of trajectory? Like, where is this going? But, you know, the more the more I, the more I watched it, the more I thought about it, the more it really make, made, uh, made sense to me, and the, the more I, like, started enjoying it. Kind of like how Travis's character development, you know, he started going, getting a little more desperate, starting, started getting a little more crazy, started going off the deep end a little more. Right. First, I was like, hmm, and, you know, when you, when you think about that in the context of him 
obsessing over Blake and eventually breaking off the serve line. You know, it's something you really like, mm -hmm. or I really liked. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've definitely talked about how I think Brian Croucher plays Travis way more unhinged than Stephen Grief did, which is probably because he's becoming more unhinged in his search for Blake. Yeah. Anyway, we did not receive any emails this week, unfortunately, but if you would like to email us, you can email us at thedoctor at decorativevegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry rants, your thoughts on Star One. You can find us on YouTube at Decorative Vegetable. You can find us on Apple Podcasts and Google Play at Zenith of Blake 7 Podcast. Leave a rating if you like the show. Check us out on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're watching Voice from the Past. But until then, the end.